Um, you think back 150 years ago, nobody had air conditioning in Florida. And people endured it, and so we can endure it today uh, with very little problem. We're going to continue our study of the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 11, and today we're going to look at verses 27 through 32. If you'd like to read along, John chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. And we pick up the narrative in verse 27, where she, meaning Martha, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and he calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews which were with her in the house comforted her. And they said, and they saw Mary, and she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Well, let's pray as our custom to pray silently for just a moment, and we'll get into the preaching of the word. Father, we come now to the preaching of the word, and we're going to need help. We're going to need help focusing. We're going to need help understanding. We're going to need help believing. And so you've given us the Holy Spirit to help us, and we call upon him now to minister the word of God to us. Help us to uh, concentrate on your word and be blessed thereby. And maybe there'll be some lost people listening over the internet, and we pray they might uh, hear the call of Christ, repent and be saved. We ask this in his name, amen. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a very extraordinary claim about the Bible. He said in Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So this reminds us that every word in the Holy Bible, in fact, every syllable in the Bible is placed there by the will of God and it has a purpose. So this should teach us to pay careful attention to every verse and in fact, every word in the Bible. Now an example of this principle can be seen here in John chapter 11, an account filled with mighty words and mighty deeds. And for that very reason, we might have a tendency to overlook some of these verses that seem kind of incidental such as these dealing with what Jesus had to say with the sisters, Mary and Martha. But John's careful to put them in here, maybe to honor these women who were so dearly loved by the Lord. But when we remember that the primary author of the scripture, the Holy Spirit, we should also realize that these verses were recorded for our spiritual benefit. In particular, Martha and Mary set forth two pictures this morning of very living faith. And that's what I want to point out to you this morning. So you'll recall that Martha was first to arrive uh, and encounter Jesus when he arrived there in Bethany. She and her sister Mary had sent for Jesus when their brother, their Lazarus, had become sick. But Jesus didn't arrive in time to save Lazarus, so it seemed at least. And a grieving Martha now went out to meet him. Martha came wanting answered, and we looked at verse 21 a couple of weeks ago. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And she saw things. The problem was Jesus' delay in coming. If he'd have showed up, Lazarus would be okay. But her faith was still strong enough to hope that Jesus could still do something. And so she said in verse 22, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. But the, the Christian faith does, in fact, 
give answers to the great problems of life and death. Jesus didn't rebuke Martha. Instead, he declared this powerful, powerful statement that we studied two weeks ago. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. But having given that answer, Jesus pressed Martha to receive it. Believest thou this? He said in verse 26. Now Martha's reply to that statement is a great example of saving faith. She saith unto him in verse 27, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. This is such a very, very important statement regarding the Christian faith. It's equal in value to Peter's great confession of faith in Matthew 16, 16. So we need to look at each component very, very carefully this morning. Maybe the most important are Martha's opening words. Yea, Lord, I believe. This shows the attitude of faith. Martha doesn't quarrel with Jesus. She doesn't dissect his words with the scalpel of her preconceived ideas about what should be happening. Instead, she receives and believes Jesus' teaching simply because she knows who Jesus is. Martha said yes to Jesus because she knows him as Lord. She knows that he is the divine sovereign whose word is absolute. And this, folks, is where true faith begins. Turning our ears and opening our minds to the word of God. Martha gives us the basis for her understanding, and the basis is the word of Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that she gets everything he's been saying. In fact, she doesn't. But she does accept it, whatever it is, because she knows that whatever he says is trustworthy. The only way to come to faith and the only way to grow in faith is to listen humbly when the Bible speaks. The written word of God is the food that makes our faith grow and get stronger. It is the fountain of our hope. It's what causes our obedience. It's what directs our paths. Where the Bible speaks, faith always says, yes, Lord, whatever it says. Job learned his lesson in the midst of intense suffering. You'll recall Job's problems that he went through. For his own reasons, and ultimately for Job's blessing, God allowed Satan to pour great trials onto Job. Not surprisingly, Job complained to God questioned the fairness of his treatment as a more or less righteous person. One of Job's dialogue partners described him in Job 35, 16 like this, Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. He multiplieth words without knowledge. You'll remember the incident. Finally, God revealed himself, showing Job a display of his divine majesty. And once he was confronted with the truth about God, Job understood his error in disputing with God. And he said, I will lay my hand on my mouth. I'm not saying any more about this. Folks, this is the attitude of faith. Job stopped talking and started listening. Now, this doesn't mean that Job stopped asking the Lord for answers, but rather that he stopped quarreling with God about the answers he received. Job 42, 4 says, I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. So Martha had seen that same majesty in Jesus. And when he answered her sincere question, she replied, Yea, Lord, I believe. Faith begins with that attitude. Now Martha's reply also reminds us that Christian faith has to include content. There are truths that Christians simply have to believe. And John's main purpose in writing this gospel uh, was to commend these truths to our faith. We've often quoted this throughout our study of John. Chapter 20 and verse 31 says, But these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. 
This is the very faith that Martha professed, and we must also know and believe if we're to be Christians. First, Martha believed that Jesus is the Christ. The Hebrew word for Christ, as you all know, is Messiah. And that comes from a word that means to anoint. Jesus is the anointed one. In its fullest sense, it refers to the three divinely pointed offices in the Old Testament, the prophet and the priest and the king. And those anointed offices served to reveal God's truth. They served to offer sacrifice for sin and to establish God's sovereign rule. So to believe that Jesus is the Christ is therefore to believe that he is the true and the final prophet the true and the final priest and the true and the final king over God's people. Now, it's doubtful to me that Martha could have spelled all of that out at this point. But she did live in a time of high expectations for the Messiah's arrival. The Jews, as you recall, were looking for some political figure to oust the conquering occupying Romans. They wanted a political leader that would bring peace and prosperity to Israel. Behind this hope was the general belief that one day God would send a specially anointed individual who would be the herald of this salvation they wanted so badly. Martha believed that Jesus was this Messiah, just as we must believe because Jesus alone is the one who brings God's salvation to earth. The second thing Martha declared in her faith in Jesus, she declared that he was the son of God. This too could have a generic meaning signifying someone who has an especially godly character. But Martha clearly meant far more than this. Did she understand that in Jesus' birth, the eternal Son of God had taken on human flesh? Did she get that Jesus possessed all the attributes of God, the same substance in power and glory with God the Father? Probably she did not, but she must have been present on one of the many occasions when Jesus identified himself as the Son of God, and she believed that he was, in some real way, the Son of God. So belief in Jesus as the Son of God is essential to Christianity. One simply is not a Christian without this confession. Now, many people are attracted to Jesus' teaching, but they deny that he's fully God. But to do so is to reject the very heart of the Christian faith. Jesus' teaching is not uniquely true unless he is the Son of God. In fact, in this case, his teaching is not true at all since Jesus taught that he is, in fact, the Son of God. The same can be said about Jesus' mighty works and especially his death on the cross. <coughs> the reason <coughs> that Jesus can perform miracles is because he's God's Son. And most importantly, the reason why Jesus' death has any importance to us is that since he is the Son of God, his and his blood alone is precious enough to make an atonement for the sins of all who believe in him. There's a third aspect of Martha's confession of faith. She believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. This means that Jesus is the one promise in the Old Testament who would bring the salvation that it spoke of. Jesus is the child promised to Adam and Eve to crush the serpent's head in Genesis 3.15. He's the Passover lamb killed to redeem God's people from sin in Exodus 12.13. He's the great prophet that Moses foretold in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He's the servant of the Lord who was crushed for our iniquity and by whose wounds we are healed, that Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5 points out. And he is the king from the line of David, whose throne will last forever. We will study in the coming months in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. 
Jesus asked Martha back in verse 26, Believest thou this? And now the question has to be put to every one of us. Do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth, revealed in the pages of Holy Scripture, is the Messiah, the Savior that God sent into the sinful and dying world? Do you believe that Jesus is God's very Son, the second person of the eternal Trinity, very God, a very God manifested in the flesh? And do you look upon him as the promised deliverer from God that God sent into this fallen sinful world to save you from God's wrath, his just wrath against your sin? You have to believe those things to be a Christian. You can't just say, I believe in Jesus, like the kid says he believes in Santa Claus. I want you to notice finally that the content of Martha's faith was entirely centered around Jesus himself. Being a Christian means far more than embracing traditional values or admiring the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> it means coming to Jesus as Martha did. Maybe with your own questions, looking for God's word to hear what he says, and replying to whatever he says, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe what the Bible says about you, and I rest my hope for eternal life in you and you alone. If you believe this, then Jesus promises your salvation. We studied back in John 5.24. Jesus spoke and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So Mary and Martha, they're very similar as one might expect of sisters. They were both equally involved physically and emotionally and spiritually in the recent death of their brother Lazarus. They had both sent a message to Jesus and together they were in anguish waiting for him to arrive and heal their brother. Together, after he died, they mourned his death and they even said the same exact thing when Jesus finally did come to Bethany. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would be alive. But what makes them so interesting is the way in which they were so very different. They experienced their shared grief in different ways, and they expressed their shared faith differently too. So while Jesus met with Martha, Mary remained in the house with the mourners. And so John wrote in verses 28 and 29, And when she had said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, the master has come and called for thee. What was Mary's response? As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. So Mary's picture of faith is different from Martha. Martha's faith said, yea, Lord, I believe. Mary speaks less, but if we can't, we can't put words in her mouth, her faith would say, yea, Lord, I come. And John makes a point about how quickly Mary answered Jesus' call. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him, verse 29 says. So just as with Martha, Jesus had appealed to Mary's faith. Jesus appealed to Martha's faith by asking whether she believed, but he appealed to Mary's faith by waiting outside the town, waiting for her to come to him. Jesus always seeks to exercise and strengthen your faith and mine, especially in times of trial and especially in times of loss. Just as Jesus taught Martha, he calls each of us to receive his word. And just as Jesus called Mary to come, Jesus calls each of us to come to himself. Matthew Henry, the great commentator said, when Christ our master comes, he calls for us. He comes in his word and ordinances. He calls us to them. He calls us by them. He calls us to himself. Martha whispered Jesus' call to Mary in private. 
maybe fearing the reaction of the mourners that had come from Jerusalem. And likewise, the Holy Spirit delivers Jesus' call to us in the quietness of our hearts. Now, if we're to contrast Martha's faith with Mary's, we might say that Martha's faith was of the head, whereas Mary's faith was more of the heart. And that can be an unhelpful distinction since the head and the heart are never truly separating. But in the gospel accounts, Mary is seen as more of an emotional person and Martha as a thinker and a doer. Martha came to Jesus seeking answers, but Mary came for love. So John's description of Mary's meeting with Jesus points out three features of her faith. And the first is her personal devotion to Jesus. Mary was grieving bitterly, following the proper way of mourning that her culture adhered to. Uh, the grieving in her house would not have been gentle. It wouldn't have been a few people just kind of sniffing and wiping their eyes. It wouldn't have been restrained. There would have been unrestrained wailing and shrieking almost hysterically according to the Jewish custom. They actually hired people to come and be wailers at funerals to show how much the deceased one was loved. But with all that commotion going on, she learned of Jesus coming and Mary left all of that and went straight to him. Those who have an opportunity to get comfort from Christ will prefer him to all other comforts that are available, even those from friends. And Mary was such a person, and her faith expressed itself in her being instantly drawn to Jesus' presence. In addition, Mary wasn't influenced by the opinions of other people. So keep in mind, it wasn't popular or even safe to identify with Jesus at this time, particularly among the people from nearby Jerusalem. The religious leaders there, you recall, wanted to kill him. And many people are kept away from Jesus today for fear of what people might say. But not Mary. Her heart was devoted to Jesus. So when he called, she immediately came and we must do the same. Mary's faith is revealed secondly by what she did when, Je when, she, when she came to Jesus. Look at verses 30 to 32. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in that place where Martha had met him. And the Jews, when they were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. Three major accounts of Mary in the Bible. We have Luke chapter 10. We have here, and we'll see her later on in John chapter 12. And in each of those passages, Mary is found at Jesus' feet. This was her way of expressing her faith in Jesus by worshiping him, and there could hardly be a better way. The book of Revelation opens up a window into heaven, and what we see there is the worship of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's how he's to be worshipped. And this raises a question for us. Why do we come to church? True faith in Jesus comes primarily to worship him. That is, to exalt his name, to celebrate his saving work, to gather at his feet and hear his word from the word of God. Third, and finally, Mary reveals a faith that relies completely on Jesus to meet her every need. In this case, Mary's great need was comfort. And so she cried to Jesus, repeating her sister's words, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Again, these are the very same words that Martha spoke, only with a minor alteration in the Greek language. 
But there's an obvious difference in purpose. Mary shows none of the quarreling that Martha might have shown. She comes reverently, she comes humbly, and she pours out her heart at the feet of Jesus. With the greatest spiritual intimacy, she is free to share her deepest feelings with her Lord. And this is the kind of faith that we're all invited to. Jesus responded to Mary with the most compassionate love. We'll get into this next week, but John will write in verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. So if we know Jesus, if we love Jesus and trust Jesus with the same faith as Mary, we will experience compassion from him that will overwhelm our hearts. So a comparison such as this between Martha and Mary's faith brings up some questions. Which one's right? Which one's better? And I think the best answer is to realize that together these sisters picture a full and balanced faith. A mature and full faith is neither of just the head or just the heart, but is with the mind and the heart joined together in faith in Christ. Now, I know some people are more like Mary. In this case, John's writing offers suggestions how someone with a faith like Mary can grow their faith. There are many Christians for whom faith is far more emotional matter than one of knowledge. It's not that they don't believe the essential truths about Jesus. After all, Mary called Jesus Lord, just as Martha did, and she would not have fallen at his feet and worshiped him if she didn't believe what Martha probably understood a little better. But Mary's faith is especially seen in her feelings. Mary shows some of the weaknesses of faith that's driven by emotion. She seems, for instance, to have been more stricken in grief than her sister. She probably had the thought of what might have been, and it seems to have overwhelmed her. Oh, if Jesus had just been here. She was overcome by the thought of Jesus' absence when in fact he was so close at hand. And therefore, while Martha helped by her knowledge of Jesus, kept looking for his coming, Mary gave over to herself that grief that she had not yet overcome. The wails of the mourners that I spoke of earlier, many of whom were likely professional at sorrow, captured more of Mary's attention and penetrated into her heart a little more deeply. Now, if yours is a Mary kind of faith, then it's likely that you can grow by devoting more effort to knowing God's word, which the Bible greatly stresses. And I believe the Bible is greatly ignored in modern day Christianity. We like the emotions, we show up at a worship service, we clap our hands, we raise our hands, we sway around, and we think we worship, and yet we have no head knowledge. Far too many Marys gravitate to the more emotional settings. In this case, the house of loud mourning. And today, in worship that's large, largely driven by human passions, when their faith would deepen if they would have reverent study of the scriptures. Growth in Mary's faith will often take place in the form of greater steadiness under affliction and a better informed understanding of Christ's saving work. And I believe the world needs that today. Martha's faith could also grow. She was helped in her grief by her stronger grasp of truth the circumstances didn't affect her as they did her sister, and she was better prepared for Jesus' coming. For her, Jesus is, as verse 28 says, the master. And what she had learned from Jesus helped her greatly. But Martha should also learn to know Jesus like Mary did, 
as her loving master and the minister to her heart. Like Martha, many biblically astute Christians busy themselves in the work of God. As Mary's always seen at Jesus' feet, Martha is generally found serving, scurrying about, doing this, doing that for the Lord. But service without a heart connection leads to anxiety, it leads to frustration, sometimes it even leads to bitterness. In churches we find, they, they say 20% of people doing 80% of the work and people get frustrated. I'm here all the time, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and these other people aren't doing anything. And they get frustrated. The, the way to grow such a faith is to nurture a closer personal relationship with Jesus. When our service is given, not simply out of conviction of the mind, but also of the heart, his presence sweetens any hardship. And the mere privilege of serving the one that we love, that brings joy to all our work. I'm happy to do this whether anybody else does it or not. Because I'm not doing it for everybody else. I'm doing it for the Lord. I'm serving him. So what should Martha do to grow her faith? The best answer is an intense and increased attention to prayer. You see, prayer is the garden where the love for Christ grows. Our knowledge of truth should bring us to come and kneel at Jesus' feet, as Mary did. Our desire to serve has to be focused through our personal relationship with Jesus. So if the Marthas among us will nurture this heart devotion, their faith will not only say, yea, Lord, I believe, but will also add a fervent love for Jesus, saying, yea, Lord, I come. So, Jesus came to Bethany to minister to the faith of all of his disciples, each according to their need. But Jesus had others in mind who were not yet disciples. Because by waiting by that road, Jesus not only called Mary to come to him, but also arranged for all of these visiting mourners to follow her there. Verse 31 says, they followed her, Mary, saying, she goeth unto grave to weep. So these mourners would have been repaid very well for their ministry of comfort to these two sisters that Jesus loved. They would be present to witness the greatest miracle Jesus ever performed before his own resurrection. Something similar happens today when non-Christians come to church. Maybe they show kindness to their Christian neighbor who's in bugging them, come, come to the church, come with us to worship on a Sunday, will you? And they finally show up. Or maybe just out of curiosity, they drive by and see this church sitting back from 405. I wonder what goes on there. I wonder what's that like in there. Or, or maybe they come out of a need that they can hardly express. But Jesus blesses their attendance causing his gospel to be preached, the good news that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans 1.16. Maybe someone under the sound of my voice has come, not yet believing like Martha did. Jesus offers to teach you, and by his Holy Spirit, he will reveal that he is God in the flesh to your mind and to your heart. What can you do in order to receive Jesus and be saved? Jesus calls you to echo Martha's confession of faith. Yea, Lord, I believe. I do believe that you are the Christ. I do believe that you are the Son of God who has come into this world. And maybe there are some listening still lacking Mary's worshiping love for Jesus. And Jesus calls to you still the same. Like Mary, your heart can rise up and say, Yea, Lord, I come. You have called me, I'm coming. And if you do, and if you believe, and you will come to Jesus with both mind and heart, it will be the beginning of something wonderful. Jesus said in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son 
path everlasting life. Imagine that. Everlasting life. That eternal life will grow in you and you will grow forever in the knowledge of the truth of God and you will experience God's love through Jesus Christ. Of course, the end of John 36 gives an awful warning for those who do not believe. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So, flee the wrath to come, go to the loving arms of Jesus, receive forgiveness for all of your sins, and receive this eternal life. It is a beautiful gospel message we have this morning, simply stating the correct faith that's necessary in order to truly believe, truly repent, truly trust in Christ. And we, we, we cannot present this any clearer, I don't think, it is your responsibility. And you will leave here a very warm but very happy Christian this morning if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as Mary and Martha spelled out this morning. Or you will leave under the wrath of God. And no one wants that for you. We pray for your soul. So we pray that God might lift you up and bless you as a believer and cause you to leave here glorifying God and worshiping Him and if an unbeliever happens to hear my voice, we call upon you to repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to worship you. We pray that we have worshipped you with our hearts and with our heads this morning, just as Mary and Martha did. Help us to be like those two faithful women Help our faith to grow, whether we're more like Mary or we're more like Martha. And we pray for lost people who have heard the gospel message. Grant them repentance, dear Lord. Save your people. Glorify yourself. And we ask that you would do all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.